This week, we're back to focusing on alternative history as we talk to author Gerald Brennan, who has released a number of books as part of the Altered Space series. Yep, I've been reading his book, Infinity Blues, recently, and it is incredible, so I can't wait to hear what he has to say. Please get in touch with your favorite alternative history books and authors. We may have missed them. You can find us at Space and Things 1 on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. And if you haven't already, please give us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Uh, Your own comments are more valuable than ours when it comes to marketing. But right now, we hope that you enjoy episode 54 of the Space and Things podcast. You're listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 54 of our podcast. So we're recording this one at the end of August, as I'm going to be on holiday when this is out. So we're not going to do the news this week, uh, but I'm really looking forward to this interview today. Uh, So let's, let's get to it, even though, as you can hear, I'm a little bit throaty. Is that the right word? I don't know. A little hoarse. Yes. Yeah, little horse. <laughs> this week, we're joined by author Gerald Brennan with a bachelor's degree in European history from West Point and a master's in journalism from Columbia University. He has so far written and released four books as part of the Altered Space series, Zero Phase, Apollo 13 on the Moon, Public Loneliness, Yuri Gagarin's Circumlunar Flight, Island of Clouds, The Great 1972 Venus Flyby, and the newest one, Infinite Blues, A Cold War Fever Dream. Plus, he's got another one coming out soon called Alone on the Moon, The Soviet Lunar Landing. Yeah, we mentioned these books in our podcast back in episode 20 uh, when we covered the history of alternative histories. Uh, So if this is a new topic for you and you haven't listened to that episode, definitely check it out later. I have been reading Infinite Blues recently and I really am loving it. So let's crack on with this interview. Uh, Roger, our guidance recommendation uh, is pings and you're cleared for takeoff. Roger, understand. We're number one on the runway. Roger. All right. Well, welcome, Jerry. And uh, we'd like to thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm just going to start with kind of a, a football question, a very <laughs> easy question. So what got you started on this alternate space history sort of odyssey? Because I remember when your first books were coming out, like uh, Public Loneliness and Zero Phase. And I was like, man, these are wild. Like what started you on that? <laughs> It was actually when I was I was in the hospital in 2012. I had had a I had had a, a previous book that had that had come out that I'd been working on for a long time, like more of a straight history World War II thing. And there's always a point with every book where you kind of realize it's kind of starting to slow down, and you know maybe isn't your uh, ticket to fame and fortune that you thought it was even though you're you're still proud of it and all that happened and simultaneously i got a staph infection you know and i went and got antibiotics and went back home and like my fever was still bad so i had to go back in and they they put me on this antibiotic called vancomycin i had this like red man syndrome where you're you get all like red and itchy this adverse uh, reaction. I was kind of feeling sorry for myself. And then somehow the thought occurred to me, like, you know, the guys on Apollo 13, they didn't feel sorry for them. <laughs> they, um, you know, they just, they just dealt with a bad situation and they kept uh, pushing. And then, then the thought was like, well, what would happen if it was a little bit worse than what it was? Cause you know, you read some speculation that, you know, the explosion happened at just the the right moment in the mission for them to, survive you know and you know obviously it's it's impossible to know like what you know how the damage could have been different you know five minutes later an hour later a day later you know but but that got me thinking and you know and and the more research i did the more i was like you know yeah these these guys still would have kept at it they uh they weren't the type of people that would just quit on something and uh so yeah so that kind of got me thinking about just alternate alternate space stuff I'm fairly new to the genre, 
particularly how you write, but also in just alternate history in general. Uh, yeah. it, I say that is in the last couple of years is where I've really got into it. But one thing I've noticed, it does tend to be, uh, most of them seem to be Cold War space race uh, things. Yeah. What, do, what do you think it is about that era in particular that seems to inspire authors to want to write their own version of events? Um, I think it's a part, I think it's a time where people were, uh, you know, the future still seemed somewhat limitless. You know, it was kind of a blank, uh, a blank slate. I think that's the appeal of of space in general is that it is that it is a blank slate and you know on earth everything's been kind of chopped up and parceled up and subdivided and there there aren't really any real frontiers here i mean there's you know parts of the planet that are still wilderness but that's you know maybe because people don't have anything they want to exploit there but you know space is still a blank canvas for hopes and dreams and fears and i think the 60s and 70s were a time where it really felt that way more so than now because i think now at least you know people have an understanding of like okay there's a lot of places in the solar system that would be problematic to go like i remember um as a kid um you know i love going to um space fest in part because i was a geek for like their space art like ever since i was a little kid i had uh Kim Poor's jupiter from io on my wall you know but then you realize like okay like the radiation environment around Jupiter is so bad that like viewing the scene would kill me in about five minutes. So like, yeah, <laughs> you know, you, you start to realize the options are, are somewhat more limited than you'd like, but you know, I, I think in the, in the sixties, it still felt a little freer. I'd say. I'm going to get to your newest book, probably near the end of the interview, but I wanted to talk a little bit about your previous uh, Alternate histories. Uh, obviously, I, I've mentioned two of them already. I mentioned Zero Phase, which is about Apollo 13. Yeah. And um, Public Loneliness, which is about uh, Yuri Gagarin. Uh, uh, here's a spoiler for y'all who haven't read this book yet. Uh, Yuri Gagarin doing a, a circumlunar flight. Yeah. Yeah. And there's another book that you've done, um, which I, I'm a, I, I, I've been obsessed with this book for ages. Uh, uh, Island of Clouds. I, I was trying to describe it to Dave today, and I, I used a word that I can't say on our podcast because we're a family podcast, but okay. a mind. It was a mind F, a yep. mind F, because <laughs> there was just so much stuff in it that I was like, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> so um, uh, can you tell me a little bit about, you know, what kind of inspired you to write that? Because when I was reading that, I was like. Some of this is nightmarish. Like, yeah. hey, is Jerry okay right now? You know, <laughs> I, I really like work that's sort of dreamlike and hallucinogenic. And it was it was a lot of that. So how did you come up with that? You know, part of it was just sitting at work at my day job and, you know, fantasizing about going somewhere and realizing, you know, it doesn't matter so much where I go as as it matters. Like, you know, what's my interior spiritual condition like so i'm in a good frame of mind you know the normal routine like going to the office and pouring a cup of coffee and you know watching the cream swirl is i can enjoy that you know and if i'm in a bad frame of mind i'm just looking for an out looking for an escape you know like you know going on wikipedia and like looking up these like <laughs> isolated destinations you know here on earth too and, and being like Oh man, it would be cool to get away to this crazy place. So a lot of it was that. Um, one thing that happened with Island of Clouds was there were a lot of technical questions that I didn't have good answers to, like right at the beginning. Um, you know, because when you're writing a, a conversation about like, all right, you know, they're 10 days away from Earth. Like, what's the light speed uh, communications delay? You know, how about when they're 20 days away? Um, so there were there were a lot of technical things I hadn't had the answers to. And at some point I had, I was bored at work and I was uh, ego surfing. I don't know if you've ever done this where you like Google your own name and like look for <laughs> the the, uh, the hits or whatever. But um, yeah, I've done it. It actually paid off. Um, in this one instance, because this guy, uh, Ben Honey, who's a, a flight controller for the International Space Station, he has a very nice blog, uh, Rockets from Cassiopeia. And he had he had said very nice things about my first couple of books. And I was like, oh, this is cool. You know, and I 
I think I might have wrote him and thanked him. But then I was starting on Island of Clouds and I was like, hmm, you know, I have some technical questions. Maybe I should ask Ben, you know, he's busy doing uh, ISS <laughs> stuff, but he graciously put me in touch with a retired uh, FIDO, a flight, a flight director uh, for the space shuttle named uh, Dan Adamo. And Dan, uh, you know, I kind of gave him the the Bellcom documents about the the Venus mission and some of the parameters and stuff. And he, you know, designed the trajectory and, and made sure I knew like wow. on every day of the mission, like, all right, how far are you from Venus? How far are you from Earth? Wow. Um, what's the comms delay? And he also helped me with uh, Celestia, the software, so that I could, you know, get a look at, you know, how big Venus would be at, at certain um, situations. So, but when I was on this back and forth with Dan, I'd already started writing. So I was trying to keep my momentum going. So I, I was writing like backstory scenes. I have, I have this pet peeve of uh, authors writing scenes where the characters are kind of like, you know, they, they have too much in common with the uh, with the narrator. Like, uh, you know, I, I read a lot of Tom Clancy growing up and all his heroes are, you know, Irish Catholic, uh, you know, good guys or whatever. <laughs> Just like him. Yeah. 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 And um, but I realized I had, I'd written one of my lunar landing scenes with like a, an all West Point crew. I'd, I'd written an Ed White and a, and a Mike Collins and a Buzz Aldrin scene. But then I was like, okay, like, well, well, maybe I should write one with Gus because he would have been likely to go if this scenario in my book had played out. So I started, you know, just having fun with it and, uh, and, and doing different things with it. And I'd, I'd written this scene in like Cocoa Beach where they're like, you know, where Alan Shepard and, and Buzz and I'd written Owen Gary are, uh, you know, at a bar. And, and uh, then I then I like changed my crew and I decided to make it a uh, Joe Kerwin. And I was like, but Joe Kerwin wouldn't have participated in this scene in a strange way. But I was like, but I like the scene, so I'm not going to throw it out. So I'm going to keep this other alternate universe. So, um, so yeah, so it ends up being kind of a, an alternate universe book where the, the characters are consistent across universes i would say but but uh but very little else was so when you're writing something like that and you're you've got real life people yeah and obviously they have family members are still alive or or some of the cases they are still alive are you concerned with portraying an alternate version of of a real person does does it come into your head at all that you very have much. to think about how how that can be perceived by by those who are still around oh very much so I think you need to be fair to people. I think you need to give them a version of themselves that they would recognize. With Island of Clouds, I read and re reread Buzz Aldrin's Return to Earth, you know, his pre-sobriety uh, memoir where he comes off as a very kind of cranky <laughs> alcoholic, I guess. Um, and, you know, tried to stay in that headspace and you know, tried to be honest to who he was in the 70s and what he would have been like as a narrator back then. In Infinite Blues, I end up purposely not naming the narrator in part because of that reason. And in part, um, you know, some of the later scenes in the last third of the book, like I didn't want to say like, you know, this character would have participated in this or this character wouldn't have. And then I realized like I could kind of have an easy out for that by you know, maybe having someone in my mind for a certain scene, but, you know, not naming them so that, um, you know, it's up to the reader's imagination, you know, but yeah, that, that was very much on my mind. I just finished the, the one after Infinite Blues and uh, Boris Volinov's the narrator, you know, Bert uh, Wies was, I think that's how you pronounce his name, uh, was, was gracious enough to share some of his uh, interview stuff with, uh, Olinov and and he kind of comes off as a jagoff kind of. I mean, he's uh, he's correcting his interpreter on what's the English word for something, and he doesn't even know English. <laughs> it's it's so funny, but you know, you, you know, you try to like not make stuff up and and uh, really pay attention to that stuff, but also you know, give somebody a, a version of themselves that they would recognize and that other people would recognize. Okay, so now I'm going to get to Infinite Blues, like. Dave said, you know, this book is sort of set during the Cold War in that era. You know, do you think um, 
and I'm kind of stealing this idea from a friend of mine. If he's listening, I'm, I'm sorry, Dwayne. I guess we're considered Generation X. I don't know, yeah. whatever. We're in that generation. Do you think the Cold War sort of, do you think it inspired us maybe more than like other generations maybe? And oh. um, do you think it inspired perhaps maybe our, our reaction to some of the events that are happening now? Because I sort of noticed that there there's a lot of things in there that, sort of have parallels to what's going on right in our world oh, yeah. in the last couple, you know, in the last couple of years, you know, or so just mainly there's a big feeling of sort of un- unease. Like yeah. you just don't know what's going to happen next. Mm. You know, we def, I think all of us can relate to that feeling right now. So do you think um, consciously or unconsciously, how do, how much do you think those inspired the book? Um, oh, I'm sure it was very, uh, I'm sure it, very much shaped my upbringing. You know, I was, I was starting to get conscious of the world in, you know, maybe 83, you know, which was kind of, you know, a lot of people kind of regard as like the second peak of the Cold War. A lot of people were talking about nuclear war and nuclear winter and things of that sort. Yeah, that is pretty heady stuff as a kid to kind of come into consciousness uh, with a world that you don't know if it's going to blow itself up or not, you know. <laughs> And then some of my first news stuff, too, was, uh, you know, the Challenger was a pretty formative experience early on. So I think we grew up with a certain sense of, like, the limits of the world and a certain sense of things going wrong. Um, You know, Challenger was followed shortly after by Chernobyl. And then, you know, AIDS was uh, becoming a big thing. And then, um, yeah, it didn't really seem like a very optimistic, hopeful time to be alive necessarily. And then, you know, in the nineties, it it turned around a bit. And then, you know, so I'm sure, I'm sure people that kind of came of age in that time frame were maybe a little more optimistic and a little more uh, happy go lucky, but, but yeah, for me, it was very much, uh, yeah, this, this kind of bleak, scary um, time to grow up, I guess. So I'm reading a quote on the back of uh, Infinite Blues here. Um, I won't say who it is, but it says you won't be able to put it put it down. <laughs> I wonder who said that. <laughs> I wonder how who said that. And and certainly since I've started reading it, it is really hard to put down. One thing I noticed when reading this book is it doesn't have chapter numbers, and I think that's part of the reason why I struggled to put it down. Because <laughs> although there are breaks yeah. uh, when I read, I'm always like, I'll just get to the end of the next chapter. As an author, what made you decide to go down that route of not doing a numbered chapter? I, say, I know it's I know it's a random question that sure. doesn't really have anything to do with the content, but I'm just I'm just interested in trying to get into your headspace on that one. Yeah, um, I like scenes rather than chapters. Frankly, I like giving the reader something they can visualize. I always think of 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 books in terms of food and like what kind of foods they're like and uh you know i like i like to think of like sushi like you you can take a you take a bite and take a bite like oh i'll have another one i'll have another one and then before you know it before you know it you've eaten this insane amount of sushi and i feel like (laughs) with, with reading ideally it's the same uh thing where you just you just want more i read this piece of writing advice basically talking about how like a scene ends when a character either gets what they want or doesn't get what they want and like you know just making sure that yeah you show the reader something but then as soon as they get what they want or as soon as they don't get what they want then you're on to the next thing you know you're not trying to drag it out i i like the little uh parts where you kind of inserted like uh people like carl sagan who could be characterized as a bleeding heart liberal by a lot of people um and, you know, somebody like Walter Cronkite, who was the famous CBS anchorman, you know, that that kind of was ubiquitous through the the space era. Yeah. Can you tell me sort of what kind of research went into putting them in as, as kind of like side characters in the <laughs> narrative? Because I like that because it was like, yeah, these guys would have been on TV back then, you know, debating about this probably, you know, it, it would make sense because I don't um, Carl Sagan wouldn't have turned out a chance to be on TV. So. Yeah, <laughs> I think I I think I happened to read a Cronkite biography that I picked up on a Kindle deal um, while I was working on this. And I was like, oh, my gosh, like, how come I haven't put Cronkite into my past space books? He was a total geek for the space program. Um, but his his World War II experience was absolutely fascinating because he and that that's. 
you know, one of the things in the in the book, I have this conversation with Sagan and Cronkite, where he's kind of talking about his World War II experiences. You know, he went to England as a as a war correspondent and was trying to report on these missions that came back, and all these all these guys are just kind of clamming up because they've been through this traumatic experience. And he, a bunch of the reporters, they talked to the uh, Army Air Corps into letting them fly along on missions. And because it was a B-17, you know, they they don't get a lot of like extra weight to carry. So that basically the deal was like you can train up as a, as a waste gunner and fly uh, on a mission, you know. So, you know, we like to think of journalists as as at least trying to be objective, but here they are literally in this story where they're, mm. they're participants and they're really, um, you know, an, an active part in this, this war story that they're theoretically observing from afar. So I, I read all this stuff on Cronkite and I was really fascinated by him. And I think I went on YouTube cause I wanted to see some of the, defense type stuff he was uh you know because i think this book mentioned that he did some you know defense related programming in the mid 60s you know before vietnam really heated up and while it was still you know cool to be like the 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 propaganda mouthpiece for the u.s government in some ways and i was looking for this stuff and instead of what i expected to find i found this piece where (laughs) cronkite was interviewing Carl Sagan about UFOs. You know, when I when I started to write this book, I hadn't, you know, and, and it's not to say, you know, this is not a UFO book, but it gets at that theme, I think, because that is um, one of the great unknowns of the human experience. You know, is there anybody else out there? Is anybody watching? Does anybody care? You know, so this little screen thing that that was going on between, uh, between Carl Sagan and, and uh, Walter Cronkite, I was like, you know, this is really weird, but I think this would fit. You know, I think ideally the research and the writing kind of feed off of each other and you, you know, like they say, you write the book to discover what it's about and you kind of discover um, the themes as you as you go through this stuff and you figure out kind of what fits and what doesn't. I really only have one more question left. And it has to do with your next book. I know you can't really give us any spoilers, too many spoilers yet, but I, I kind of know the basic uh, what it's about. So let, let, tell tell us a little bit about uh, Alone on the Moon. Uh, when might we be able to expect it? And uh, I'm real excited to see this come out. Um, This Alone on the Moon, I can say it takes place in May of 1970. So it kind of... Um, circularity has been a big uh, theme in this series. And so the series ends up kind of being circular um, time-wise because we're coming back to uh, um, May of 1970. Of course, it's a different May of 1970 than when uh, zero phase happens. Um, i trying to think of what else I can say about it. It's coming out in May of 22 and... Yeah, it's a Soviet, it's a Soviet uh, lunar mission. And and I'll say too, like the, the fascinating thing for me about the Soviets landing on the moon isn't so much them landing as having a lander with one person. So like, it, you know, when you, when two guys come down and come back, they can kind of talk to each other about what happened. And, you know, each one of them knows what the other person saw. So you can't really, uh, you can't really BS too much, but if only one person goes down, like who knows what happened or what they saw. So, um, you know, that was a big, uh, a big part of this. So, um, but also I guess I could say too, um, Boris Volinov, I, I picked him in part because um, his birthday, December 18th is a, is a, is a really important day for me for personal reasons and getting into his story. He just had a, just a fascinating run of like terrible luck. Like he, you know, he was the backup for uh, Vostok five. Um, and, but then they told him he was going to launch and they were like, you know, we're taking the uh, Bykovsky down. You're going to be the one that launches. So he, you know, he thought like he, the day of that all this training is going to pay off and he was going to go up. And then, then that was yanked away from him. And, um, 
you know, Voskhod uh, or Voskhod. I, I, I call them like by the English names in the book. So I'm thinking like, oh, Sunrise One, you know, like that was pulled away from him yeah. too. And, uh, you know, then when he, then when he finally does go up, he survives one of the most harrowing uh, yeah. um, reentries in the history of manned spaceflight. You know, he just fascinates me as an example of, uh, you know, bad luck or good luck or good bad luck or whatever you want to call it. That, <laughs> You know, it just kind of makes you think, like, what does it mean to be lucky? You know, to be, you know, to be picked for this great thing, but then to have all these weird, bad things happen to you, but then, you know, to survive when other people maybe didn't survive. You know, it's uh, it's uh, it's fascinating to me. So, is this the last one of your alternate history, or have you got other things planned? Um, yeah, Alone on the Moon does feel like it's going to be the last one. Um, no! no. Yeah. <laughs> I have oh. well it, maybe it's it's time for Emily to write a cycle. It's time yeah, to absolutely. Uh, I would like you know, to I, yeah, think, I need to. <laughs> I think, you know, once you've once you've written a few of these, you start worrying if you're repeating yourself and you know, you start worrying, okay, am am I describing the you know the the far side of the moon the same way I described it like two books ago? And you know, if so, are people are gonna notice like I I ended up like rereading the other four books in preparation for writing the last one. And um, yeah, I'm not sure I could do too much more without like really uh, plagiaring myself to an an unacceptable uh, degree. There's a, there's a quote by uh, Borges, um, the uh, Argentinian author. um, That's basically a, Every artist eventually becomes his or her, his or her own least astute imitator. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> no, I don't. I don't want to get to that point where I'm just like, you know, putting out derivative works of my earlier stuff. So, um, I understand that process <laughs> absolutely. I get it. Yeah. If if a TV or film presenter or producer, sorry, came to you and suggested turning these into a visual representation of your work. Yeah. Would you be interested in that? Obviously, t- let's take finance out of it because most people wouldn't turn <laughs> down the money. But but it, yeah. can you can you see these books as being on the screen as well? Oh, I, yeah, I would be thrilled if somebody was was uh, that interested. Um, you know, one of my one of my buddies actually read these and loved these, and he's like he's like you should get in touch with the four old mankind people and like see if you get. Like right for them, and I, and I do. I am really enjoying uh, for all mankind. I mean, it's pretty, uh, um, it's pretty adventurous at times in terms of uh, you know plotting choices and whatnot. But I am really enjoying it. But but yeah, I'm you know I'm doing a different thing, and I'm I'm uh, I'm happy with my vision. And it would be nice to see, um, you know, if if somebody else was willing to share that. My personal pick to play Buzz Aldrin would be um, Tom Hardy. But, uh, that's, mm, yes, uh, yes. I <laughs> wow, see that it. would. I can see that. Yeah, yeah. I can see it. I, I can it. see it outside my control, but you know, I just yeah, I'd throw that out into the universe to to see if it uh, manifests itself. That would be amazing. Uh, yeah, I could see that. I, I, this is just you mentioning for mankind has made me uh, have one other question. Sorry, but <laughs> you know, it kind of has to be asked. Beyond your own books, are there alternative histories, particularly about space, which you would recommend to people? Um, For All Mankind's been a lot of fun. Um, I uh, have enjoyed that a bit. I don't read a lot of alternate history, but I really enjoyed, uh, I I enjoyed the book, The Man in the High Castle. Uh, Mm. The series was a little slow for me. I didn't quite, you know, I kind of pulled the plug on it after a little bit, but but the book, The Man in the High Castle, I thought was was just an excellent literary meditation on some of that stuff. And uh, um, Fatherland, the Robert Harris book, I really um, enjoyed that a lot. But it's weird because I don't I don't necessarily read a lot of alternate history uh, myself. So um, yeah, <laughs> I, I guess that's probably a good thing because it it means you're not prone to copying someone else's ideas or or it, it could be a good thing yeah i don't know <laughs> yeah i'm afraid to write my own because i'm like i don't know how i'm gonna be better than like jerry brennan or not be better but be on the <laughs> same level you know 
So I don't know. I, I I'm a little nervous because like your stuff is so good and it's very accurate well, and stuff. You. And I'm like, I, I don't think I can be. I don't know if I can reach this level. We'll see. I think I'm gonna trot out just short ones and see if like one person likes them. Maybe. Well, don't try to be me. Just be the best Emily Carney you can be, and that's gonna be something. I I. Uh, you know, I went, I went to the military academy and there was a certain part of me that was kind of sad when I realized, like, oh, I, I wasn't going to be Douglas MacArthur. I wasn't going to be like Eisenhower. Um, and then you realize, like, wait a second, like those jobs are already taken, you know, and yeah. I can't be Douglas MacArthur. I can't be Eisenhower, but I can be Jerry Brennan. So um, I would just say, you know, be Emily Carney and that'll be that'll be enough. You know, Solid, solid advice. that. Um, so, Jerry, right. thank you so much for joining us yeah. and and for write and and for writing these books. Uh, as I said, I'm I'm really enjoying it, uh, Infinite Blues, and uh, yeah, p- uh, please consider right. doing yeah. another one. Yes, please. I'll think about. Right. I'll think about it. <laughs> I have to listen to the muse. You know, if, if the muse uh, whispers another one in my ear, you know, we'll see. Awesome. Excellent. Awesome. Excellent. Thank, thank you. you very much. Holy crap! It's beautiful out here. It sure is. It's something else. Isn't it great getting insight into an author's mind and, and their process? That's one of the great things about us doing this show is uh, as an author myself, you know, I mean, I, I would never obviously copy off of other authors, but it's really cool to see sort of like their the machination sort of in their mind of how they put something together, like, you know, and sort of all the little pieces that, you know, the little puzzle pieces. So it's really I love that. That's really exciting. And and Jerry's just a, a super guy. He's been a really big sort of supporter of uh, a lot of stuff and space hipster since he's found out about it. And I'm really glad his uh, altered space books have gotten really such a such a following. I mean, people love those books. They have kind of a little fan club. I wouldn't say a little fan club. They have a pretty decent fan club of their own because, you know, whenever a new one drops, everybody's got to get it. So... <laughs> And yeah. I'm I'm really excited to see uh, his next one, Alone on the Moon. That that is going to be kind of terrifying. <laughs> just the idea to me of just landing on the moon and being by yourself, because I'm used to the, the like yeah. American idea of oh you have a buddy with you, or maybe not a buddy, but you know just somebody else who you can be like hey Jim or whatever you know somebody. Not this time. Like that, that sounds scary as hell to me. I'll, I'll be brutal. <laughs> so I'm excited to see what this is about. Yeah, it's like when when they talk of uh, mm-hmm. the command module pilots being the loneliest people in space when they're going around the moon while the other two are on the surface, it's got to be even lonelier being on the surface on your own. I mean, that that whole experience must be crazy. It was well, never happened, but uh, that that's got to be super surreal. Yeah, I mean, with nobody to, else to really talk to, like around you, and just all this landscape. Just untouched, untouchable. That's almost a nightmare. So I don't know. I don't know if that's good or a nightmare or not. It, it's sort of like, um, what's that movie with Tom Hanks where he has just the softball? Castaway. Uh, yeah. Wilson! <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of like that. Like, does he, do you become like that after a while? Like, I'm, I'm really curious to see what, what's going to unfold in this one. So in the show notes, there will be links to Jerry's social media accounts and also where you can buy his books. So you can uh, perhaps let him know what you think of his books if you read them or let us know as well. Don't forget to let us know. But uh, if you've not checked out one of these, You've got two massive thumbs up from us uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the quality. They really are something. Yeah, he does a fantastic job, and everything uh, is really thoroughly researched as well. Like he really gets, you know, he gets with the right people if he doesn't know something, and you know, he researches it. So the, these are uh, spectacular. Y'all got to check them out. Oh, look at the mountains today, Jim. When they're all sunlit, isn't that beautiful? It really is. Oh, my golly, that's just super. Hello, this is Dave, and as I talk to you now, it's Friday the 3rd of September. The rest of the episode was recorded on August the 23rd in anticipation of me being on holiday for this week 
And I am going on holiday. Well, I'm not really going anywhere. I'm taking a few days off uh, from this Sunday, the 5th, all through next week, which is why we had to pre-record. However, since we recorded episode 53, which came out yesterday by my time, uh, we recorded that on Tuesday, so three days ago, there's been some big news stories. Now, I hope you've kept up with all of that. That was rather convoluted. Anyway, um, I feel like I've got to briefly drop in and tell you about these stories so you can read more about them in the show notes. Uh, because if I wait till next week, they may not be relevant, and I'm sure that the stories may have moved on by then. So a quite dramatic story has been reported about the Virgin Galactic flight, which took place in July with Richard Branson on board. Now, the New Yorker magazine of all places has reported that a red warning light came on in the cockpit, which perhaps should have led to an abort. And as a result of the problem, the pilots had to fly outside the airspace, which was allocated to them by the US Federal Aviation administration, the FAA. The article also claims that Virgin's lead test pilot and flight test director, Mark Stuckey, who was monitoring the flight from the ground, was sacked after the flight because he's been raising safety concerns within the company. Now, this is an incredible story and you have to read the full article. Now, I've summarized it there, but I feel like I need to read it a couple more times to really get to grips of what has happened. Um, now, this all goes al alongside the backdrop of yesterday, the 2nd of September, Virgin announced the next crew, which is due to fly later this month or early October. However, the FAA then grounded the spacecraft pending a probe into that last flight. So it's all kicking off, basically, uh, around this. And... I'm reminded, and I'd love to be talking to Emily about this, I'm suddenly reminded of the Mike Mullane blog post, which we talked about a few weeks back. Uh, I think it was the episode where we had Clayton Anderson on, in which he talked about um, the dangers of spaceflight and are these companies being honest and open with their consumers and us, the public, about the risks involved. It's a fantastic blog post, which I will put in the show notes as well. But this story is pretty damn huge and I don't think it's going to go anywhere and there's potentially going to be a lot of developments between now and next week. So read the article. If you've got an opinion on about it, I'd love to know. Uh, this is pretty crazy. Also, um, perhaps perhaps more positive news, uh, Firefly Aerospace attempted their first orbital launch from California yesterday. I say kind of positive news because... Unfortunately, the launch failed just after the rocket went subsonic. But this was a first attempt and the rocket had zero heritage hardware. And that's a really, really impressive performance uh, for a brand new rocket. So I'll, I'll put the video uh, in the show notes as well. Please check it out. But good job, Firefly Aerospace. I'm sure they've got loads of data to help them get it right. In history, there have been very few rockets that have launched first attempt, gone to orbit without any hardware which was previously used. Also, the final trailer for Netflix's documentary for the Inspiration 4 flight came out yesterday on September 2nd. Now, assuming all things have gone well, by the time this episode comes out on the 9th of September... The first two episodes of that should already have been out for a couple of days. And it's annoying because we probably should have spoken about them. But this documentary looks amazing. So if you've got Netflix, go and watch the first two episodes. If the trailer is to go by, it, it looks like it's going to be really cool. And I can't wait for this mission to launch. It's supposed to launch on the 15th of September. So I'm sure our next episode, we're going to be talking all about this documentary and that. But uh, yeah, definitely the trailer will be in the show notes. But by now, hopefully, uh, that documentary should be out for you to go and watch. Anyway, what's going to happen now is we're going to jump back to the, the pre-recorded show where I'm going to say there's no news. Anyway, sorry for messing around with your head there. And I could see, the, see all the way to the ground, just like Lonnie LTV. Piece of cake. So that's it for this week. No news, as we said earlier. Uh, but we'll catch you up on all of that next week when I'm back from holiday and hopefully I'll have a voice. Uh, thanks again for all your support. If you've enjoyed this, please hit the share button or post a link on your social media pages. Uh, but as we've said a few times, let us know your alternate history recommendations as well. This is, uh, as I said earlier, it's a genre which is new to me in the last couple of years. So I am open to all suggestions. Yes, definitely get in touch if you have recommendations. And thank you so much for listening. But don't forget, in space... 
No one can hear you me. Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.